Today's case, we have a client with right shoulder pain that's been ongoing for about three or four months or so. They came in previously, said that it was starting to get a bit sore, and we noticed that it was very difficult to bring the arm up into abduction above the head with the palm facing down, but much easier with the palm facing up, which is pointing towards some kind of impingement of the supraspinatus in between the greater tubercle and the acromion. We did some treatment to the rotator cuff. We talked about a few postural changes that we could make, but unfortunately it's made no difference. If anything, it's got worse over the last two months or so. It's very difficult to lay on that side and it was also difficult to not lay on that side with the arm coming across the body. Any types of movements with the elbow away from the side was quite painful and quite difficult. Lifting overhead was almost impossible due to pain and also getting the arm into that position was very, very difficult. On examination, we looked to get an idea of which compartment or which area the main pathology could be. So we've got glenohumeral joint issues, which could include things like adhesive capsulitis or frozen shoulder, as it was also called, and uh, osteoarthritic change within the glenohumeral joint, the ball and socket joint of the shoulder. We have acromioclavicular joint problems with the joint where the collarbone comes up and joins onto the acromion. And then we have a lovely category of subacromial issues, which could involve things like rotator cuff tears, rotator cuff tendinopathy, calcific tendinopathy of the rotator cuff, or subacromial bursitis. So we did an examination to try and tease out which ones it was most likely or least likely. So started off with a nice, easy external rotation, active external rotation of the uh, shoulders. So we stand with our elbows into our sides like so, and then slowly, while keeping the elbow tucked in, look to bring the arm out this way, back to the center, and then we compare that to the other side. And then we check that passively, so that's where we, the clinician, do the movement ourselves. And we're looking to see, is there any obvious difference between one side compared to the other? And is there a difference with active movement compared to passive movement? As we brought the arm out into external rotation, there was some pain and discomfort into the uh, glenohumeral joint no pain or restriction on the other side, but the difference was only maybe 10, 15 degrees at most. There wasn't a lot of difference, and we're really looking for a significant difference of 30 degrees or more for it to be clinically significant. Acromioclavicular joint pain is much, much easier. It's one of the only areas in the shoulder which pretty much refers straight to where it is, so it stays very, very local. So we push down, put some pressure on top of the AC joint on the right side and the left side, and there was no real change, no real difference. No sign of any deformity, so any previous injuries or any increased chance of osteoarthritic change on one side compared to the other that might be causing some kind of underhooks underneath the acromion, which should then be wearing and putting pressure onto the supraspinatus tendon as it moves beneath the acromion and between the uh, greater tubercle there. So then we tested the muscles. We tested the supraspinatus first by bringing the elbow out to the side and then applying pressure onto the elbow, and straight away, as soon as we put any force through, it was painful and gave way. External rotation was painful, but not quite so much, and then getting into the internal rotate position was very, very difficult, so therefore we didn't perform the lift-off test. On the other side, everything was fine, full strength, no pain, no anything at all. So having tested the muscles, there is the potential of there being a rotator cuff tear. However, with there being no trauma and no specific event, it means it's less likely. Yes, we can get spontaneous rotator cuff tears, but that tends to be in people much, much older than this current client was. Therefore, that was moved down my list. Much more likely is something like a tendinopathy and or a calcific tendinopathy or subacromial bursitis, as we're looking at something that's most likely relatively increasing the amount of tissue that's got to pass through and between that canal of the acromion and the greater tubercle. Because we know from previous, if we externally rotate the shoulder, which then takes the greater tubercle away from the acromion, we have much better movement and greater ability to, to move the arm before we get any pain in the shoulder. So how do we tell the difference between a tendinopathy and a calcific tendinopathy? Well, what we do is we use our diagnostic MSK ultrasound, which came up with an absolute winner on this one. As soon as you put the probe on, we could see that there was no fluid within the long head of biceps tendon sheath. Therefore, the chance of there being any fluid further up, so within the subacromial bursa, was 
decreased. Also, if there's an increase of fluid within the glenohumeral joint, usually it spills over into the long head of biceps tendon sheath as well. So therefore, again, it reduces likelihood of any of those pathologies even more. We looked at the subscapularis and the infraspinatus and they were absolutely fine. But as soon as we looked onto the supraspinatus, we saw obvious signs of calcific tendinopathy and calcific deposits within the supraspinatus tendon. And when we performed dynamic imaging, so that's where you keep the probe on the patient and then they do a particular movement. When we went into abduction, you can see here a small calcific density. And as we abduct the arm, you can see it move between the humerus and the acromion. And that's as far as the client was able to get. So as soon as that calcific density tries to pass between those two surfaces, that's when the pinch happened. And that's when we got that impingement. And because this has been ongoing for some time and the tendon is irritated, it's become swollen. So that makes the problem even worse because the size of the canal between the acromion and the greater tubercle hasn't increased, but the size of the tendon has. Therefore, it's even tougher for it to pass between and it's only going to get sore and it's going to become more painful the more we try and repeat that movement. Therefore, this client is not a candidate for rehabilitation straight away. We need to try and reduce the swelling in the tendon first and then maybe look at starting a rehab program from there once the size of the tendon has decreased because we're looking at a three millimeter difference in size between the good side and the not so good side. So it's quite a big difference. And that might be done using a corticosteroid injection preferably ultrasound guided into the subacromial bursa. There may be a need at a later date for something like barbitage where uh, that helps to break down the calcific density within the tendon, which then may make the tendon smaller and therefore again, easier to pass through that canal between the acromion and the greater tubercle. We did this in about 15 minutes. We went through the basic history, the examination, and also the ultrasound as well. And the client's happy, they've gone off their referral much more informed about what their condition is and whether they need to go down the exercise route or the injection route first of all. So win-win all round. Hope you enjoyed case of the day. We'll see you for the next one. Bye-bye.